We are in the middle of a uh, series, a, a weird series, in the book of Ecclesiastes, um, and we're going to be picking back up. This is our third week, and we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And what I'm going to ask you to do, this may be weird for you, I understand, uh, but because we want to uh, give a whole body expression of our submission to God's Word, I'm going to ask everyone to stand uh, for the reading of God's Word, uh, and then we're going to open it up in just... A moment. So the words will be on the screen, and we have Bibles in the back, so if you don't own an ESV, we'd love to give you one as a gift today. Now, I'm going to be reading Ecclesiastes chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 11. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works, I built houses and planted vineyards for myself, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all can have a seat. Again, if this is your first time here, we're in in a very weird book of the Old Testament. Uh, It's an ancient book, the book of Ecclesiastes. And as ancient as it is, it is something that could have been written in our age because it's asking a question that we all ask, that our cultures ask. And it's this, what is the good life? You've heard me say it week one, week two. You're going to hear me say it week three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way to 12 as we spend time in this book because the central question that this is asking is what is the good life? And really, it's a central question of all of humanity. My prayer has been through this series that God would, by his spirit, would reveal to us just a couple things. First, I would love for us to come to a knowledge, a a realization that we are shaped by our culture, that culture has a plan for our life. I hope that we would see ourselves in this character that we call Kohelet, the speaker. I would hope that we would be able to combat the the ways in which we are trying to be formed by our culture with the gospel. That we would see that every single answer that Kohelet is going to give us in the book of Ecclesiastes is actually, uh, it leaves us lacking. And that we would find an alternative to this. And so... For all that, as we continue into chapter 2, help me to pray real quick. Father, we thank you again. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, that we have enough health and enough energy to be here today. And we want to pray for those, Lord, so many of us who are away, who are unwell. And we just ask, Lord, that you would be with us this afternoon, that you would help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful for you and help me to uh, forget the things that are, uh, rather, help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful and help me to remember the things that will be. And may these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And the church said, amen and amen. Who here loves a good truism? 
Well, what's a truism? I'm glad you asked. A truism is a phrase or a sentence that sounds really deep and meaningful and profound on the surface, but it really doesn't give us any kind of new information to see our situation in. It's something that our culture, that all cultures would see as kind of self-evident or really, really obvious. These are statements that we use all of us, without even thinking about them, without even thinking whether what we are saying is true or not. We assume that these things are true. These are some of my favorites. It is what it is. It's helpful. Thank you so much. The apple never falls far from the tree. Nice. Nice. Thanks. Helpful again. Another one is money doesn't buy happiness. Well, I'm going to die trying. Some things never change. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Now, whether uh, we want to admit it or not, at some point when we have been lost for words and someone has come to us with a sticky situation, we've used a truism, whether or not that stands up to reality or not. But I believe that there's one truism, one of them that stands out amongst the many in our age that sort of captures the spirit of our age. And it's this. It is as long as you're happy. As long as you're happy, right? It doesn't matter what you do, as long as you are happy. A variation that I hear a lot around wedding planning or, or, or uh, house renovations is, is this, is whatever makes you happy. Like, that's all we care about. What do you want to be when you grow up, Johnny? Doesn't matter, as long as you are happy. Happiness for our culture has become the absolute singular vision for what we believe our lives are for. We exist to be happy. And in fact, this isn't even questioned or challenged. And to question or even challenge it makes you seem like a complete alien to your cultural moment. Happiness has become the unquestionable, listen to me, the unquestionable assumption of our culture. In a book called Happiness, A History, someone actually wrote a 600-page book on the history of happiness. Darren, he says this, Darren McMahon, he says this. It's promises, it's expectations, it's allure. Happiness is everywhere around me. In New York City, where I made my home in the roaring 1990s, people splashed themselves both literally and figuratively with a cologne named Happy. Captured, it captures the ethos of the time. In London, implicit pleasure seeker, illicit pleasure seekers offered the drug of the decade, ecstasy, which was stamped with a happy face. In Vienna, every morning, I drank orange juice that proclaimed, have a happy day on the label. In Paris, like so many other places, a trip to the local bookstore revealed the contemporary obsession. Entire walls of pop psychology and new age religions beckoned in the direction of everlasting content. Don't worry, be happy, says the song. He says, we can be happy, we will be happy, we should be happy, we are commanded to be happy. We have a right to happiness. Surely this is our modern creed. And this is so true. It's so true that even in the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776, I'm American, by the way, that's my confession. In the Declaration of Independence, we are uh, given happiness as an inalienable right. It is our right to be happy. And the designers of our iPhones made sure that the first, I did this, this is, this is firsthand research here, that the first 28 emojis were different ways of expressing happiness. We are obsessed with happiness. And so I'm asking, you know, and so when, when, when we bring that to light, people ask, hold on. So are you saying you don't want people to, what kind of monster are you that you don't want people to be happy? So let me just say this from the top. I am not personally anti-happiness. I am not anti-joy. I believe that pursuing happiness, in fact, is a good thing. But the ways in which that we often do that introduce chaos and destruction and havoc onto the world and into our lives. In the end, in the end, the ways that our culture offers us, invites us to pursue happiness actually in the end produce the very opposite of what we're looking for, right? The ways in which we are invited by our culture to pursue happiness 
in the end produce the opposite of happiness. And so today I want to look at some of the ways that we are discipled by our culture to look for happiness, ways that even Kohelet looked for happiness. And Kohelet, if you haven't been tuning in, he's the, the narrator. He's the guy who is speaking in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he is looking for a way to answer the question, how do I know that I am enough? How can I be happy? How can I search for meaning? And here today, we're going to be looking particularly at the path of pleasure through possessions. Now, as we talk about pleasure and happiness, the two are not strictly synonymous, but they, uh, they overlap to a very, very great degree. Happiness is the goal, right? That's what we all want. And our culture says that in order to get there, we must receive and search out pleasure and possessions. So if you want to be happy, the way to do that is to experience pleasure and amass possessions. That is what we are told. That is the answer to what is the good life. And we need to realize, I need to realize, we all need to realize that our culture has done a phenomenal job, a great job at curating this desire within our already broken hearts. The desire, the belief that we can discover or create. And this, listen, this touches us all. The desire, the belief that we can discover or create a meaningful life through pleasure and possessions is one that each and every single one of us has believed or is believing to one degree or another. It's, it's, simply, it's simply in the water. And the billions of dollars that are spent each year on marketing devices and, and strategies. I mean, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why everyone in a commercial is so damn happy all the time? You won't find like a normal person in a commercial. Why? Because they want to tell you if you bought this vehicle, or if you had this particular eyeliner, if you went on this kind of vacation on this particular cruise, if you buy my new book, or if you get that kind of house, then finally you will be happy. If you were in a certain kind of relationship or studied at the university that I work at or bought this particular kind of, I mean, we get down to even the kind of shampoo. I mean, imagine your mood changing because like the kind of shampoo you used. And, and maybe, you know, listen, I, I got nothing up here. So like, maybe it doesn't matter for me. Maybe it matters for some of y'all. But just imagine that we actually buy the lie that says, if I get this, I will be. And we fall for it. Hook, line, and sinker almost every time. And so what I want to do today is I want to allow this unorthodox wisdom teacher, call it, to teach us a thing or two about what it actually means to pursue the good life. And this is what we're going to see in Kohelet. He is going to test this hypothesis. Pleasure is the key to a full and meaningful life. And I will obtain pleasure, he says, through wine and possessions and women. That is his hypothesis today. So let me see, let's see where this takes us. Come back to, with me to chapter 2, verse 1. And I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. And I said of laughter, it is mad. And he doesn't mean mad, like, like Eshe kind of mad, it, like, oh, that's mad. No, he's saying this is mad. This is, not, this is not good. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. And so Koholet. He begins this long speech. It's going to go all the way through till chapter 12. And his assessment of the journey was that while wisdom holds some value, right? We, we learned this last week, that in the end, because of death, it actually amounts to nothing. That while wisdom holds some short-term value, in the end means nothing. And so he turns his attention from wisdom, saying, I, I still got wisdom. Now I'm going to turn my attention to something else. He turns his attention from wanting to achieve the beautiful life, the good life through his mind, and now he wants to achieve it through his body. Again, Kohelet gives it away from the jump. He tests himself with 
wine. And he, from the very beginning, says it um, all amounts to nothing. And there's so much debate here about whether Kohelet is, uh, he becomes like a, a Hunter Valley-esque wine connoisseur on the southern rolling hills of Paris, or whether he just becomes someone who's frequenting the pub like all day and all night. Like I didn't even realize until I came to Australia that bars were open at 9 a.m. It is a true thing here. And, and th- so w- which is, is he some like irresponsible drinker or is he some kind of high-end wine connoisseur? Regardless, the point is, Now, whether he's tipsy or full out drunk, he is trying to find the good life through the drink. And imagine if he had access to the breweries and the craft beer culture of Australia, right? Like, would he ever get to the end of his path? In the end, he realized that if he couldn't find lasting meaning by enlightening his mind through wisdom, then he would try to numb it with alcohol. This was his journey. And then we continue reading in verse chapter 4. He says, I I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. And so, while my boy's on the drink, he gets to work. And I'm not I'm not sure what the housing market was 2,500 like BC or so years ago, but regardless, what he sets out to do is incredibly, incredibly impressive. It'd be more impressive if, he, if he's able to do this in Sydney 2022, uh, but he gets to work. He builds houses and he decks them out. This is not, listen, this is not just some rapper's 16 car garage somewhere. He is building parks and homes and like this is massive what he is after this is not just rich money this is this is rich rich money this is elon musk money this is bezos type of money he builds mansions and sets up vineyards listen do you know how hard it is to plant a garden it's very difficult for me to plant a garden Like, you laugh, but I have no, I don't have one green thumb in my body. I remember for Catherine's uh, last birthday, uh, a year or a couple years ago, I wanted to ball out. So I told her, I said, hon, listen, I'm going to take you to Flower Power, and you can get whatever you want. And I felt like a G for about 10 minutes. I got real humbled by flower power when I, when I gave her just, just full reign. And this, this, I felt like a rapper for about half an hour until I saw the bill. And I was, I was in trouble, right? But uh, he it humbled me to even plant a little garden at home. And yet this guy is planting vineyards. I mean, and not just one vineyard, but, but like it, he goes from zero to 60 real fast. And then he's like, I want a frolic. And so let me build some parks and some gardens with all kinds of fruit trees. The first time that I went to the Royal Botanic Gardens in the middle of Sydney, I was stunned. I mean, I grew up in the concrete jungle in Brooklyn, and I, like, I, did, I had no idea that in the middle of a city you can find something so beautiful. And then I went to the Chinese Garden of Friendship by Darling Harbor. And I don't know if you've been there, but over in the West in Auburn, there's another botanic garden. And I can imagine as I've walked through just the ginormous like just lands of beautiful trees and fruit trees and and jasmine and just flowers it is absolutely stunning and this guy is like tipsy saying yeah let's let's go for it like let's just build some some vineyards and listen this isn't easy it's it's not easy I don't know a couple years ago I don't know if you've ever seen uh the Netflix and this is I'm not I'm not recommending this, uh, but if you have already, then just repent with me. But I don't know if you've ever seen that Netflix special called Fire Festival. If you've ever seen that, you would understand just how incredibly difficult it is to create an infrastructure that could house just a house party. Like, so there was these guys, right, and some has-been rappers, and uh, they, they, they started promoting this 
fire festival that was going to happen somewhere in the Bahamas, I think I remember. And it was a failure of ginormous proportions. I mean, it was the failure of failures. It was supposed to be the party of the century, and it was the failure of the century. They couldn't even, you know, there was a subplot where they couldn't even get water to the Bahamas, right? And, and it was just, it was wild. And to think that this, this Kohelet, this Solomonic figure is just building these things. He, he's just, he's just going at, this is not a, this is not the project that you still haven't done because during COVID that you promised to do around the house. Like this is, a, this is not some side gig. He's giving his life to this. In a couple of verses, he's telling us he's built pools and he's obtained slaves and herds, presumably to work the land. And in verse 8, he says he acquired silver and gold and the treasures of kings and, pro and provinces. And so he explores the, the, the life of pleasure through amassing things, parks, gardens, And then architecture, wine, singers, songs. Like imagine like just getting singers and, and just like it, this is phenomenal. And then he has this throwaway line. He has this throwaway line and he says, and many, I had all these things and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Now, the word used here for concubines, I will not be able to reproduce in a sermon and keep my job. But it is not concubines. There was a word that he could have used to say concubines, and this is not it. This word is quite a derogatory term for women that were seen simply as sex objects and worse. This is what he did. He amassed everything he could have. He would have put to shame Hugh Hefner. And this is the kind of guy that we're dealing with here. And this is the guy who in the, wor in the eyes of your typical frat boy has reached the zenith of life. This whole entire pleasure project that Kohelet goes on is an incredibly modern one and an incredibly selfish one. It's not, un it's not, You know, uh, it, it wasn't uncommon for princes and kings to build and plant vineyards and parks and, and things like that. But if you remember, if you hear it in the text, he says, I built houses and planted vineyards for who? Not, not for, for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. I made myself pools from which to water the forest. I gathered for myself silver and gold because the reality is that this was not uncommon and yet the motivation behind it was that he was doing this for himself. And then he sums this up in verse 9. He says, so, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all, for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, 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 all is nothing. All is vanity and a striving after the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. And so here we go again. Behold, all is vanity. The man who has it all, according to some, it all amounts to nothing. I mean, he withheld nothing from himself. This is the Ariana Grande of 2500 BC. You may be confused there, but in 2019, Ariana released her, uh, her record album, uh, Thank You, Next. And the second The second song released was called Seven Rings, one of my favorite to sort of dissect. And this thing broke record, Seven Rings. It, it earned 12.2 million streams in 24 hours. She broke her own record. Now Adele's got the record now, but anyway, I digress. The point is, this was a big song in 2019, and it goes a little something like, <clears throat> like this. I want it. I got it. I want it. I got it. I want, this is musical genius. I want it, I got it. I want it, I got it. You like my hair? Gee, thanks, just bought it. I see it, I like it, I want it, I got it. 
Whoever said money can't solve your problems must not have had enough money to solve them. We're going we're gonna to edit this out for YouTube. I don't want to get sued. They say which one? I say, nah, I want all of them. Happiness is the same price as red bottoms. She couldn't even rhyme the last, you know, the, the, the last word. This, this is, this is, the, this captures the ethos of Kohelet 4,000 years ago. I see it. I want it. I got it. There's going to be nothing that will stand in my way to pursue my own pleasure. Nothing. Nothing that my eyes saw is, is, is something that I kept from acquiring for myself. Whatever I wanted, I got and I spared no expense. But in the end, what Ariana may already be feeling or what she definitely will feel one day is what Kohalat felt as he took a bird's eye view of his life. And it's this, that it's all meaningless. And many of us are still stuck in this vision of our life that we will actually, like it didn't work for Kohelet, it's, it may not work for Ariana, but it will work for me. We're stuck with feeling these feelings of if I get more, if I acquire more. And yet the man who had it all says it is meaningless. And so where does that leave me? Where does that leave us? If pleasure and possessions are so base, should we then own nothing? Should we then buy nothing, enjoy nothing? The question is that as disciples of Jesus, what should be our relationship to pleasure and possessions? And the first thing I need to say that I need to be so, so clear on is this, that God, in fact, is not anti-pleasure. Jesus is not anti-pleasure. In fact, listen to this. When God was creating the world and he created us, he created chemicals in our brain such as serotonin and dopamine that actually give us what? Pleasurable sensations. Dopamine and serotonin are not a result of the fall. Satan, Satan, while he wants to hijack pleasure, is not his. When God created the world, it was a world full of pleasure, full of of different kinds of foods and the tongues that are designed to be able to experience those different types of foods. A world bursting with pleasurable sounds for the ear to hear. A world that is crammed with beautiful vistas for the eye to enjoy. A world of different textures for us to touch. A world full of different smells for our olfactory senses to enjoy. God, we can say, is a God of pleasure. In fact, Psalm 16 will say this, you will make known to me, Psalm 16, verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are what? Pleasures forevermore. We often have this view of God that he's just an angry old man. And yet what the, the, the view that we have here in the scriptures is that he is a God who is, has pleasure at his right hand forevermore. And yet... And yet, when we remove God from the equation and make pleasure the thing that we seek above all else, we actually lose it all. Because the key is that he wants to redeem pleasure, not get rid of it. You may have heard it before, and I'm going to say it again. C.S. Lewis has the greatest take on this in his book, The Weight of Glory. He says this. He says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels to us, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We, he says, are far too easily pleased. You see, it's not so much the pleasure seeking that is wrong. It's the thing in which we find our pleasure. And as we pursue pleasure according to the ways of Kohelet, according uh, to the ways of intoxication or sexual exploits, the way of possessions, what ends up happening is that we end up unleashing a world of hurt upon ourselves and into the world. Sex is 
good. We need to say that the church needs to proclaim that. It needs to reclaim that, that sex is good. But it is terrible when we try to use it as, uh, 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 to fill our, our, the holes in our soul. We end up deforming ourselves. Possessions are good and they're necessary. And yet, what ends up happening is that our possessions end up possessing us. You see, this world that Kohelet is pursuing, the world that we are discipled to pursue, actually creates a world of greed and exploitation and slavery, a world that is curved in on itself, a world that is crashing in upon itself, a world that cannot hold the weight of what it is looking for. And it's this world that God deeply loves, that God is deeply committed to seeing its full healing and restoration. And he will see that this healing happens, listen, not through eradicating the pleasures of wine and sex and possessions, but by offering us a greater one. And he will see to it that this healing happens, that we have the pleasure of knowing God as Father rather than judge, that we have the pleasure of having Jesus as our brother, the pleasure of having the Spirit dwelling within us, the pleasure of knowing that He has called us to partner with Him in the renewal of all things, the pleasure of knowing that we have been called to do whatever it takes to bring the wayward home, the pleasure, listen, the pleasure of knowing that your life matters, that nothing that you will ever experience will be wasted. The pleasure of knowing above all else is that you are known and that you are seen and that you are loved as you are and he loves you so that he will not leave you where you are. The pleasure of knowing this, that in the end we get God and we begin to understand that the gospel does not eradicate our pleasures, but reorders them. We can accept, once we get that, once we get that God is an anti-pleasure, uh, we actually get the gift of wine and the gift of sex and the necessity of, and the gift of possessions without those things destroying us. In the end, in the end, the call of Christ to deny ourselves is a call to deny a lesser pleasure for the sake of a one, a greater one that will last forever. And as I invite Zach back up, I, I, want to, I want to remind you that the power to do so is found only in experiencing this reality. That for a moment, listen to this, that for a moment, Jesus would deny himself the pleasure of heaven to pursue the pleasure of renewing the world through his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And as we join in, Onto what he is doing. We, as we put our faith in him, as we pledge our allegiance to Jesus, we too will be able to pursue the pleasure that will never fade. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this weird and wonderful book. We thank you that we have such a clear picture of someone who pursued pleasure with abandon who pursued intoxication and, uh, and, and pursued, Lord, possessing the world and yet was left wanting. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would do a special work in this room, that you would break any, any sort of hold that possessions would have in our life, that you would break the hold of greed in our lives, that you would break the hold of believing the lie that the more we have, the more we are. We can't do this on our own. And so we ask, Lord, that you would do this work in us. And all these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.